Let's turn together to the 11th session of 12, uh, Ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of the church. We have one more session, that is eschatology, the doctrine of end times. Uh, when we meet next, uh, we'll come for a good discussion, or if it worse, a good argument on end times. But until then, we have one more area to cover, and that is the doctrine <clears throat> of the church. <clears throat> Let's begin by looking at the bottom of page 304, uh, a quotation by Havlick. The church is never a place, but always a people. It's never a fold, but always a flock. Never a sacred building, but always a believing assembly. The church is you who pray, not where you pray. A structure of brick or marble can no more be a church than your clothes of serge or satin can be you. There is in this world nothing sacred but man, no sanctuary but the soul. Now that's a good reminder <clears throat> as we move into the doctrine of the church that the church fundamentally is people. It is the people who are the members of the body of Christ, which we will discover as we open up uh, the uh, notes. So let's begin on 305 by giving some definitions. First, we're going to be looking at the Reformed view, and I want to highlight a couple of features of the Reformed view of the church. It is the community, that therefore Old Testament and New Testament members, it is the community of all true believers for all time. So from a strict reform standpoint, the church began in the Old Testament with believers there who believe in an anticipation, in anticipatory belief uh, <clears throat> towards the coming of Christ, uh, as well as those who are in what we call the church age who look backward at the cross. It's the community, Old Testament and New Testament community of all true believers for all time. <clears throat> the Baptistic view, uh, perhaps espoused best by Millard Erickson, those who are true believers, here's the key idea, in Christ. So however you get there, if you're in Christ, you're a part of the body of Christ. Uh, I'm going to suggest the uh, dispensational view, which is a little bit lengthier because it's a little more precise in my understanding. It is that spiritual organism. There's the body idea. That spiritual organism of which Christ is the head. So we have in the New Testament the idea Christ is the head of the church and the body <clears throat> or is composed of all believers in Christ. So he, that spiritual organism of which Christ is the head and is composed of all generated people, regenerated people. Now notice the uh, timing. From the day of Pentecost, which a dispensationalist would say is the birthday of the church, from the day of Pentecost until the very last person added to the body of Christ before the return of Christ. So it's still being added to. The, the universal body of Christ is getting larger and larger and larger. And so with Christ as the head, when that last person comes to faith in Christ, then the body is complete and uh, Jesus will return for His bride, for His church, at least from that particular dispensational view. Now, dispensationalists argue among themselves, and so I'm going to go out on a limb and align myself with what's known as progressive dispensationalism in part. And what I believe is that within the Scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, you have a concept that's bigger than the church. <clears throat> and that concept is the people of God. Uh, within the people of God, there are folks who got there in a different way. But they are all legitimately, equally, fully, uh, perfectly a part of this, this one people of God, this family of God, if you will. And it is composed of people who came to faith in the Old Testament, the Old Testament believers, or we'll call them saints. It also is composed of those of us who are in the New Testament era, after the death of Christ and the day of Pentecost and so forth. So we have the New Testament church, or saints. Then, if you believe there will be a literal tribulation, the fulfillment of Daniel 9 and the 70th week of Daniel, uh, Revelation 6 to 19 from a more literal viewpoint, uh, that people will come to faith in Christ during the tribulation. They are part of the people of God. And then in the millennial kingdom, if you see a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, the Davidic kingdom, in the millennial kingdom, people will be born, some will come to faith in Christ, and they also are fully, completely a part of the people of God. 
I would simply remind you, from, from my understanding, how are people saved? Here's a simple uh, uh, answer to that. People are saved by grace, through faith, in God, the Redeemer provider. Some looking forward to the accomplished work of Christ on the cross, others looking backward upon the completed work of Christ on the cross. No one is a part of the people of God, no one is a part of the family of God, apart from the saving merits of Jesus dying on the cross. It's just a matter of historical perspective, whether you are on one side of the cross or the other. All right? So that's my basic view on that. Let's take a turn to page 307, <clears throat> get into the derivation of this word we call church. The biblical word is ecclesia. That's where we get ecclesiology from. Ecclesia is a compound Greek word. Ek is the preposition meaning out of. Kaleo is the verb form, which means to call or to summon. So the called or summoned out of, the assembled ones, the called ones, would be another way of saying uh, ecclesia or church. Uh, our old English word, kirk, is from the Greek word kuriakon, which means pertaining to the Lord or of the Lord. And uh, making that an English word, anglicizing it, making it an English word, it comes out Kirk. If you go to Tulsa, you might could attend Kirk of the Hills. There's a church over there, a really nice church, a good friend of mine's over there. And so you could go to Kirk, Church of the Hills, or Kirk of the Hills. Uh, the theological distinctions about this whole word church is uh, based upon an analysis of how that word is used in the New Testament. And you'll look on the left-hand side of the page, on 306, there's a pie chart. <clears throat> Notice that uh, in this particular pie chart that almost half of the occurrences of ecclesia uh, refers to a singular local church. Uh, if you have plural churches, but still local churches, local expressions, that's another 31%. So over 80% of the usage of the word ecclesia is referring to a local church visible church in the New Testament. Uh, it also can refer to the universal church, but that's only 15 occurrences of it. Uh, it that's, it's undeniable, but yet there are 15 occurrences, and then there, the word ecclesia could just mean congregation or mob or assembly or something to that effect, and we see that uh, throughout the uh, book of Acts as well. So with that in mind, what I want to distinguish between is the universal body of Christ, the church, and the local expressions of the body of Christ, and that's the church as well. Uh, notice at the bottom of 307, church can refer to the universal church. Look at our passages, Colossians 1.18. And he, that is to say Jesus, is the, here's the key idea, head of the body. In other words, Christ is the head, the church will be the body, the growing, expanding body, in my thinking. He is the head of the body, the church. Not a local expression, but the whole universal body of Christ. This is what binds us all together when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and all of those spiritual operations occur instant instantaneously in us. One of the things is we are baptized into and become a part of, a member of, this invisible universal body of Christ, which gives brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ uh, uh, a, a fresher or deeper kind of meaning. All believers around the world of all races and so forth and backgrounds and social status and so forth, all of that uh, binds us together because of our faith in Christ, binds us into one greater body. We are a part of the universal body of Christ. But there are also local expressions. So here at Fellowship, uh, Northwest Arkansas, we are one local expression of the greater universal body of Christ. And you'll turn the page and you'll see uh, a, a good example. It's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, look at verse 2, to the local expression, to the church of God, where? In Corinth. We're the church of God in northwest Arkansas. Uh, on Pleasant Grove Road. Is there any others? I, I guess we're the only ones. So we're the local expression here. And so uh, you have the universal body. You also have the local expressions. Listen to this. Most of the New Testament teaching is directed towards local churches. 
The universal church is a, is a theological concept. It's an important theological concept. But most of the ethical demands, most of the marching orders given to the church come out of the context of local churches. As a matter of fact, much of the New Testament is written to correct problems that are occurring in local churches and become a part of our doctrinal understanding. The most uh, gifted, the most charismatically gifted church in all of the New Testament had the most problems, and that was the church at Corinth. And so consequently, we are a local expression of the greater body of Christ. Now that begs the question, uh, what then is the foundation of the church? And there is a key passage in Matthew chapter 16 we want to look at. You're familiar with it, but let's look at it once again. When Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, that's on the, on the coast of the Mediterranean, He asked His disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? What's the word on the street? What are they saying about me? Well, some think you're John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. Others, Jeremiah. Are one of the prophets, or perhaps they're even referring to the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Moses said the prophet was coming. Well, that's uh, fine, but who do you say that I am? Now look at verse 16 and 17. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ. Remember, the word Christ means Messiah. You see Christ in the New Testament. You see Messiah or anointed one in the Old Testament means the same thing, anointed one. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied by saying, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, or Bar-Jonah, or son of John. Uh, Simon, uh, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. Now verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, Petros is the biblical word. It means a small stone. You are Petros, a small stone. You're rocky. That's what it is. And on this Petra, large stone, boulder, or rocky shelf, it's a huge piece of stone, you are a little rock, and on the huge rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. All right? So the question is, What's he talking about? Is the church, what is the rock? Is the rock Peter? Is the rock Christ? Or is the rock the confession of faith that Peter has made? I'm glad you asked that question. Because on page 308, turn sideways, you've got a chart. Yes, we have a chart. If you come from a Catholic background, you would fall under view number one. The Catholic background... uh, would say that the rock was Peter. And Peter is the first pope uh, and and, uh, from from a a papal succession. There have been popes who have always been uh, uh, within uh, within that line of succession to be the heads or the leaders of the church. There are some arguments for, there are some arguments against that. I'll let you read those at your leisure. View number two is a much more common view It was the view held by most of the reformers. It was held by Augustine, even as uh, early as his time, in which the the reference here is that Christ is the uh, rock. It's upon the rock, they would say the foundation, it's upon the rock of Christ that the church is built. And that is a very good theological possibility. In fact, if you fall under view two or three, you're in good evangelical tradition. Some believe view three, while not denying the critical importance of Christ, obviously, but view three says that in the context of the passage, really it was the confession of faith. We know who you are in your person. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That profession of faith in the person of Christ is what the church is built upon, is that we have a preaching mission to go out and preach the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died on the cross, and so forth and so on. There are a couple of arguments for, a couple of arguments against. So if you fall under view two or three, you're in good evangelical tradition, good Protestant tradition. All right, so the foundation of the church. Is it Christ? Is it the truth of the confession? Uh, I'll let you decide. All right? At the bottom of the page, there are also, just by way of filling out the doctrine of the church, there are some... uh, there, there are some figures or almost like metaphors that really show the vital relationship between Christ and His body. So turn the page to 310. And I've listed for you about six or eight, eight or nine, whatever it is, uh, images that are used for Christ and the church. Here's what I want you to understand. 
These images demonstrate the inseparable linkage between Christ and His church, the dependency of the church on Christ, the vital relationship between the church and Christ. He is the head. We are His body. The shepherd, sheep, cornerstone to the temple, bridegroom, bride. All of these images teach us about the inseparable linkage the vital relationship, the complete dependency of the church upon Christ. All right? They're, they're, it's, it's within the imagery, but it's also within spiritual reality. Uh, therefore, when it comes down to saying, uh, who does this church belong to? The church always belongs to Christ. Uh, we are just simply the body that does what the head tells us to do. Uh, the church doesn't belong to the elders. It doesn't belong to founding families. It doesn't belong to uh, personalities. It doesn't belong to the congregation as a whole. The church theologically belongs to Christ because he's, the, the church is inseparably linked to the person of Christ as demonstrated in the images.